My name is Jean Garrison, and I direct the Global and Area Studies Program, and I want to thank all of you for coming out on a beautiful but windy Wyoming Sunday. Um, I know many of you got blown in from fairly far away, including some of my family, and I just want to say that it's really such a pleasure to uh, be able to bring international affairs programming to Laramie and uh, to you on this Sunday. Um, I have a few brief um, opening remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Richard Solomon uh, and get, just get on with the discussion. Um, we have a, a discussion this afternoon focusing on America's grand strategy, grand strategy in the 21st century. And we're really lucky to have a longtime prominent insider, Dr. Richard Solomon from the RAND Corporation, to share his thoughts. Um, this is also the opening to our Wyoming Goes Global conference, so I invite all of you to take a look at your program and come up to various panels that we have on campus tomorrow. All events in the Wyoming Goes Global conference will be up in the Union uh, tomorrow, starting at 9. Uh, let me say a few thank yous before we get to our program. I want to thank our partners for making this and other events that we sponsor around the state of Wyoming possible. Uh, most prominently, this event is part of the Global uh, Global Studies Excellence Initiative, which is made possible to a great extent because of the Wyoming Legislature, which in 2006 uh, established the, the Excellence in Higher Education Endowment. Our senior visiting scholar in Global Studies, Mark Wall, who's right here, Ambassador Mark Wall. Um, thanks, Mark. Mark will be joining in the discussion portion of, the, of this event this afternoon, but Mark has been on campus all year. Uh, teaching classes and also going around the state of Wyoming uh, in, in a series of talks, including uh, a series entitled Reflections on a Diplomatic Career, and most recently Sheridan and Powell and Casper, um, and he's going to be visiting some Chambers of Commerce meetings and, and other events such as that across the state during his tenure here. I'd also like to thank a series of UW supporters. Without the support of the President's Office and President McGinnity, without academic affairs, and our Vice President of Academic Affairs, Maggie Murdoch, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, including uh, Dean Paula Lutz, um, and of course, most importantly from my perspective, all the staff and students, particularly Carlinda and Manuela, um, who are with Global and Area Studies, who made this possible. Would you help me give them a hand, please? I would add a couple of um, uh, special thank yous. One would be to Danielle Peck, who is the president of the International Studies Student Club, who has been so helpful in this event and a series of events that our program sponsors uh, across the state and also here at UW. Um, and a couple of outside partners have been very essential in our World to Wyoming uh, outreach program, the Ruth L. Bogan Foundation, and also the Wyoming Humanities Council. It's partnerships like this and also our partnerships on campus, including all of the faculty and students from all the colleges and departments who are part of the program tomorrow. So I really do encourage you to come out and see the great things that are going on in internationalization. This effort to launch the Center for Global Studies, this initiative, is part of the ongoing excellence that we have in international education here at the University of Wyoming. And this is just our next step to move forward faculty research graduate student uh, research internationally, and also um, some of the work that our undergraduates do. So let me move on uh, to our, introduce our speaker. Dr. Richard H. Solomon is a senior fellow at the RAND Corporation currently doing research on challenging U.S. foreign policy problems. That's what he's going to be talking about this afternoon. Until 2012, Dr. Solomon served as the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace which is an independent, nonpartisan institution established and funded by the U.S. Congress, committed to work on, to, and on issues on the ground to solve real problems in difficult places. I think that's what a lot of our graduate students and faculty are involved in as well. Solomon's government career uh, includes uh, as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He negotiated the Cambodia Peace Treaty, the first UN Permanent Five peacemaking agreement, had a leading role in the dialogue on nuclear issues between the US and South and North Korea, helped establish the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Initiative, 
and also from 92 to 93 served as U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines. His career also includes stints as a senior staff member on the National Security Council staff, and of course, several years in the State Department. Dr. Solomon came to government and moved into his work at USIP after being a professor of political science at the University of Michigan. He got tapped by Henry Kissinger to be part of the early negotiations with the opening for China. Uh, he holds a PhD in political science with a specialization in Chinese politics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Solomon, we'd like to welcome you to Wyoming and to the podium. You're all very good to come out on a Sunday. And uh, I came out uh, looking forward to some time in uh, which we say late winter, early spring. I, I came out with my uh, heavy overcoat and uh, encountered not just, uh, which we say, a nice early spring day here by just talking to my wife and it's snowing back in Washington. <laughs> which is only another example of how uh, everything seems to be topsy-turvy these days. You can't count on anything being very, very predictable, which is, which is part of the story that uh, we'll be talking about today. I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Gene Garrison for the honor to uh, help you inaugurate your Center for uh, Global Studies. Uh, this is a very worthy venture for, for reasons that uh, uh, we'll talk about. Uh, but the basic point is that we're in a very new, different, and challenging period in history. And we need as a country to train new generations to deal with the many challenges that uh, we're facing these days. Uh, new, new opportunities and uh, uh, challenges to our security, our economic interests that are quite, quite new and different. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, back in the 1950s to have been trained. I knew the technology was going to do something screwy. Uh, uh, I was very fortunate to have been trained thanks to the Ford Foundation uh, and to uh, a U.S. government program to have been trained in uh, what for a kid from Philadelphia was a pretty esoteric language, uh, Mandarin Chinese. and. Uh, Un, un, unanticipated, I got myself caught up in uh, some of the most interesting uh, diplomatic and other uh, issues of our times as the Cold War uh, unfolded. But uh, as I see almost day by day in my work in Washington, we really do need new generations who have the skills and the perspectives to deal with, uh, with a very different period in history. So I think uh, your venture here really is, is very well, well timed. Uh, another point uh, to make is uh, in my work over the years, I don't know how many trips I made uh, traveling back and forth between the East Coast and the West Coast, which were the centers of gravity of much of the work on, on international affairs. And all those trips were over the American heartland. And it didn't seem, uh, at least in terms of those of us working on policy, that that the heartland was very much caught up in, uh, in the policy dimension of things. I mean, we were all aware, of course, that agricultural exports were very important to our, uh, our place in, uh, in the global economy. Uh, but uh, it wasn't clear that uh, those of us uh, who enjoy this part of the country, and by the way, I'm, I, this is my favorite part of the country. I'm very lucky to have a getaway place at one state over, so I'm pretty familiar with this uh, part of the country. But I get away from all the nonsense of Washington politics uh, coming out here. But today, the, the heartland is, is increasingly critical to our, our role in the world, not just agricultural affairs, and by the way, in the parts of Idaho that I'm familiar with, guess who's buying agricultural land? It's China. The Chinese are worried about their food security down the road, and, and so they are trying to position themselves uh, interlinking their, their economy with our agricultural output to deal with their, their problems. The heartland, of course, has been the, the source of a lot of 
very dedicated man and woman power for, for government, for the military. But what's happened, and, and I'm, I know you're all more, more aware of this than I am, that with the energy revolution that seems to be upon us, that this state in particular and the surrounding areas are going to be increasingly critical to uh, our ability to maintain uh, both economic competitiveness for our own industries, but also to reshape uh, the global energy economy. Uh, it's something that, uh, again, I'll, I'll comment on later. So, again, it's all the more important that this, this institution, this university, which is training specialists in, in energy engineering and, and related issues, have in addition this uh, perspective that you'll be training people in uh, for, for international affairs. Now, how does this country deal with, with the outside world? Uh, that's a big question, uh, but I just might note that over the 200 and some years of, of our own history, uh, we've gone through a number of phases, and I know you're all familiar with that that perspective that the Founding Fathers put forward about no entangling alliances. It's a little bit of a dis, uh, distracting phrase because, in fact, the Founding Fathers were very clever manipulators of the continental rivalries that were going on at the time between Great Britain and France. Uh, the Spanish were a part of that, that equation and the, the Russians. so. It's not as if even from the early days of the Republic we weren't aware of and trying to deal with the international community. But uh, as you know, for most of the 19th century, we felt ourselves protected by, by the two oceans. That, of course, changed at the beginning of the uh, 20th century when we had built up our economy and really did start to engage in the world, first economically, but uh, we tried our hand at colonialism in the Philippines, uh, the Spanish-American War being a, being a part of that. And then for the, the recent century just ended, uh, we became deeply involved in, in global affairs in ways that you're all well aware of. Unfortunately, much of it involved in three wars, two of them very hot, and then the Cold War. And out of that came a perspective on our involvement in world affairs that involved the United States playing a major, a major security role, and one in which we were out in front playing a, a critical leadership uh, position. Each of those phases in the past century, we had something that, again, you might call a grand strategy. Woodrow Wilson hoped to make the world safe for democracy through the promotion of the rule of law, the League of Nations. Uh, but our country at that point, uh, the Congress wasn't prepared to sign on to that uh, perspective. So as you know, Wilson's effort uh, didn't succeed and we retreated back into a phase of isolationism. But that all broke down, of course, at the end of the uh, 19, 1930s. Pearl Harbor, World War II, we had a very simple perspective strategy for dealing with with the, uh, the fascist, the Axis powers of unconditional surrender. Not a very uh, elaborated conception, but it uh, guided us through the Second World War. Then the Cold War. What was our strategy for dealing with uh, the challenges we faced from the Soviet Union and their, their various allies? It took us about 15 years through several major crises, certainly the Korean War and then the the Cuban Missile Crisis to take some ideas that uh, uh, had been developed uh, by some of our, uh, our thinkers uh, of thinking of ways of deterring rather than uh, taking on the Soviets militarily uh, and uh, constraining their outreach through a range of, of political programs. So deterrence and, ca and containment by the middle of the 1960s became the watchwords and the, and the strategic uh, perspective. But what of today? Uh, there's only one little glitch here. The, the title of my talk should have a question mark out of it. So I think one of the things that uh, we want to explore today, and I hope we'll get off into a bit of this in the 
question and answer phase is what should be our role in the world today? I think you're all aware the, the public opinion indicates that our public is pretty fatigued after a decade of two terrible conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, let's mind our own business and uh, let others deal with these seeming intractable conflicts. Uh, but is that going to stick? There are other voices in our public debate that say you can't withdraw from the world. The United States having been a, a global leader for much of the 20th century, uh, we can't even lead from behind, which was a perspective that came out of uh, the recent Libya conflict, that we are a global leader and we have broad international responsibilities. Now, how would we fulfill those responsibilities? Can we even afford it? Uh, we're all well aware of the economic problems that uh, our, our country faces. So they're very, very fundamental issues related to the question of will there be a grand strategy uh, for the, the coming century? So with that as uh, an opener, let me see if I can make this uh, seem work. I think the first point, and I draw here on a, uh, a Native American philosopher, Yogi Berra, the future ain't what it used to be, which is a way of saying that the kinds of challenges that our country faces are in many ways un unprecedented. That uh, we're in a period of many strategic surprises, as they say. Uh, they can uh, run from 9-11. Uh, who, who anticipated we were going to get uh, attacked in the way we were uh, in 2001? The energy revolution, I would say, uh, if it plays out in the way we anticipate, is another strategic surprise, not just for us, uh, but for the rest of the world. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, that a little more. Arab Spring, the impact of the cyber or information revolution. These are bringing about uh, system transforming changes. How do we deal with them? Well, there's another Yogi Berra perspective that unfortunately seems to uh, give some sense of how we're proceeding without the notion of some broader international strategy. That is, our, our leadership confronted with these changes is proceeding incrementally, uh, adapting to the latest crisis, and so, uh, we're not sure exactly where, where we're headed. As one of my uh, colleagues who's involved in this RAND study points out, the nature of these changes is coming at us so fast that uh, we really can't through, uh, think through fully their, their implications. And the president, our leadership, has to make decisions without fully knowing what, what the outcome is, is likely to be. So I hear almost every week as I go to various meetings in Washington, people bemoaning the fact that we don't have a sense of strategy, a vision for the role that our country ought to be playing uh, in, the, in the coming uh, period. You've got to plan nonetheless. And uh, as uh, General and then President Eisenhower pointed out, uh, even though planning may have its limitations, if you're not planning, you don't use your resources in any kind of organized way. The big bureaucracies go their own, own way. And uh, so you do have to use some planning. But uh, as any military leader will tell you, uh, and as Mike Tyson reminds us, you know, once the fighting starts, once you're punched in the nose or the mouth or whatever, your planning seems to go under the the crisis atmosphere, the exigencies of, of whatever seems to have uh, come at you. One of the things that we have to plan for in a time when there are these uh, dramatic changes is the notion of strategic surprise. And uh, here, in theory, this country has some uh, cultural and uh, institutional assets which should, relative to a lot of other countries give us a leg up, a, a, a bit of an advantage. And that is, this is an entrepreneurial society. We're pretty adaptable. Uh, we can respond certainly in terms of uh, our economy 
in rapid fashion to training, uh, to uh, changing uh, threats and opportunities. And given the fact that uh, the world is, is in such a period of rapid change, can we institutionalize our ability to manage strategic surprises to keep ahead of the competition? What is the alternative? The alternative was, uh, since I have a China studies background, I think was beautifully articulated by, by the Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping, used an old phrase about uh, when you're crossing a river, uh, you've got to feel your way stone by stone as you work across an unfamiliar environment. And in some ways, that is what we're really doing these days. We're, we're confronted, the Arab Spring, who anticipated the Arab Spring? Suddenly, we lost uh, a working relationship with Egypt that was, had been critical for decades to maintaining stability uh, in that part of the world, just as one example of the kinds of events that are coming at us uh, thick and fast. So again, we have to think about our institutions as being prepared for uh, strategic surprises, otherwise we're just uh, proceeding in a, in, a reactive, in a reactive fashion. Well, that's a broad uh, perspective on the, on the challenges we face. And what I'd like to do uh, now is run through a range of challenges that uh, I see as, as presenting our country, uh, both uh, threats to our security and economics, but also some real uh, opportunities. There are almost uh, two dozen of them by the time you crank through them. I won't spend the afternoon going through all of them. But it's worth contrasting them with where this country was at the start of the Cold War, and it was actually where the Rand Corporation got started. In the late 40s, our country faced primarily three challenges that uh, Rand and other institutions had to think through. One is that there were new weapons, primarily the atomic weapons uh, that had come out of uh, World War II, uh, missiles that again uh, had been uh, started up during the Second World War, and long-range uh, bomber aircraft. The Rand Corporation actually uh, came out of the Douglas Aircraft Company, which was trying to figure out well, how do we use these uh, new weapons uh, in some strategic sense. The second issue was the character of our primary geostrategic challenger, the Soviet Union. Uh, I hear people today saying, well, what's Putin all about? We don't understand what his game plan is, how he's operating. Same question was asked back in the late 40s and early 1950s. What is the character of the Soviet uh, challenge? Today, what is the character of the challenges we face, not just from, uh, from a resurgent Russia, but from China? Uh, what is the approach to dealing with the political turmoil we see in the Muslim world. Uh, but back in the late 40s, early 50s, that was the second issue. The third that our leaders had to deal with uh, was the economic reconstruction of a world that had been pretty well destroyed economically in the Second World War. We were very fortunate that our economy actually was not only the strongest in the world, but we had emerged out of the Second World War uh, in a very strong position in that regard. And we had the resources to shape the global economy through the Bretton Woods agreements that uh, Dean Acheson and others uh, developed in the late 40s uh, that really uh, structured the global economy. Today, beyond those three, as I say, we have the better part of uh, uh, two dozen uh, different challenges that we face. And let me now try to uh, run through them uh, to give you a sense of the, the issues that we're, we're wrestling with. First of all, economics. Economics has traditionally been the foundation of our, of our strength, both domestically and in global affairs. And uh, we're, we're living in very different economic times. Today, it's not a world destroyed, but we're in a world with many very serious economic competitors, certainly uh, China, now the second largest 
largest economy in the world and uh, in variety of dimensions, very competitive with us. But that can be said uh, uh, for other countries, other countries as well. We're in a period where we're rethinking the, the structures, the, the economic instruments by which we organize our own economy and uh, seek to uh, project our strength and, uh, and build up our own economy through international relationships and trade. And uh, we're doing it now in competition, in particular with China, uh, which has a mercantilist approach to uh, international economics. They would like to see exclusive trading relationships control over natural resources, while we're promoting uh, through the uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and a similar new arrangement uh, in the Atlantic region broad open, uh, open trading relationships uh, that reflect our own approach to, uh, to economic development. So that competition is underway and we're gonna have to see how it, it plays out over the next uh, uh, decade or so. Related to that is something that is fundamental to certainly this, this institution and this, this part of our country and that is uh, the, the changing international uh, energy situation. Um, everybody now is talking about the energy revolution, about our energy sufficiency. Um, you all perhaps in the Q&A session are gonna tell us whether this is overhyped. Uh, we know that we have uh, serious issues of, env of environmental impact uh, to deal with, but this is an area where as best we can tell, the United States is gonna be in a totally different position than it was certainly a decade ago. Uh, for, we had built energy infrastructure for importing uh, various forms of energy, uh, developing uh, renewables, and suddenly beginning in five or six years ago, we discovered that given the fracking technology uh, the ability to uh, uh, get tight oil out of uh, deep underground rock formation, suddenly we had the prospect of being energy sufficient. And more than that, uh, being able to uh, break out of the uh, defensive position we had uh, given the role that, that, that uh, OPEC played. Uh, you all, some of you maybe remember the oil crisis of 1973, we're now, if the energy trends play out, gonna be in a position to really restructure global energy markets. And uh, one of the policy issues that uh, we'll be facing is, what do, you, what do we do with this energy? Do we use it primarily to put our, our enterprises in a more competitive position globally because of the lower uh, prices they will have to pay for energy? Or do we export those resources to undercut the kind of uh, leverage that Putin is trying to use right now in Europe as he pursues his territorial ambitions? So there's some very interesting policy questions in terms of international affairs and our global strategy on how we use our energy resources as they play out. One of the uh, Dramatic changes also, as, as I see it in Washington, uh, since the Rand Corporation uh, works very actively in the defense area, is that the entire character of our uh, national security posture is gonna be changing uh, in uh, the coming years. And it's not just because of the, uh, the budget cuts that we're, we're facing, but because of the impact of new technologies and, and the way that other countries, other groups around the world are developing capabilities that will challenge our security. During the Cold War, deterrence, as I mentioned earlier, was key to our, our security. But is deterrence breaking down in an era of suicide bombing, in an era when North Korea is, and, and Pakistan in particular, are facilitating the uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, particularly uh, nuclear technologies. 
So we're going to have to rethink how we deal with our security in one of the most uh, serious challenges, uh, which is how we deal with weapons of mass destruction, not just uh, uh, nuclear ones, uh, but uh, bio weapons uh, and uh, uh, with, with other forms of uh, mass destruction that unfortunately seem to be emerging from the next phase of technological innovation. Other countries are developing their own defenses, which uh, are tending to cancel out uh, our particular strengths with uh, our, our very strong military. And so our ability to deter what China or Russia, uh, even North Korea might be doing is uh, in increasingly being checkmated. So we're living in a much more competitive world just in terms of conventional military and then you have the issue of terrorism, or what uh, we refer to as, as asymmetric warfare. The fact is, uh, the bad guys, those who would do us harm, as we discovered on 9-11, are able to use, whether it's aircraft or other new technologies, uh, to work against our defenses as strong as they may be. And so uh, we're in a period, again, trying to rethink in very fundamental terms, our, our security environment. And among the new threats that uh, we're trying to figure out, uh, the whole cyber revolution uh, is fundamental to it. Uh, this country innovated and has made enormously constructive use of the internet, of cell phones, uh, but uh, some of the bad guys are figuring that out uh, as well. And so, uh, here's a new dimension of our security, uh, the ability to, to, to control what you might call the, the nervous system of our society, all the electronic communications that are central to the way our economy works, our government, our social relations. They're insecure these days, as we know from all of the hacking that goes, goes on. Uh, and it's, an, uh, again, another dimension of uh, the security environment that we're trying to think through. Along with uh, those issues has come a change in the, the partnerships, the alliances that uh, we've always relied upon in dealing with uh, the outside world. The Cold War imposed a certain discipline upon our, particularly our treaty allies, uh, the, the Japan, uh, the NATO states, all the rest, as long as they felt under real pressure from the Soviet Union, despite the fact that uh, they would make demands on their relationship with us, but the fact is there was a certain stability to our alliances. Well, uh, again, it's a world where our allies don't feel that kind of pressure. One of the issues we're dealing with right now is Japan and its conflicts uh, over uh, territorial claims in the the East China Sea, the, they're taking initiatives that could threaten to draw us into a military conflict with China. And so we have uh, a new pattern of dealings with, with our traditional allies. allies. And then there's uh, a category that uh, only emerged in recent years in part of the uh, policy community. That is the notion of frenemies. That's obviously a contraction of the notion of friends and enemies. It's to say that uh, there are many countries that we have important interests in dealing with who are near, near, uh, neither treaty allies uh, nor outright adversaries, uh, but countries we have to work with. Probably Pakistan is, is the best current example of a country where uh, we have very, very difficult uh, relations, but we need to cooperate with them with that government for a range of reasons. China could be put in the same category. China neither an ally nor, nor an adversary. Uh, they're somewhere in that middle category and our diplomacy has to be updated uh, to deal with these new types of uh, relationships. And then there's a, uh, a new category of people out there, 
that indicates how much the international environment is, uh, is changing. And that, that is what you might call uh, the non-state actors. Uh, and here you have groups that are not traditional governments, but an Al-Qaeda would be a, uh, a particularly egregious example of this. Uh, they're non-state entities. They've been able to figure out how to empower themselves with, with weaponry, with clever tactics, and they have to be factored into our strategy for dealing with the world. And uh, they're not the only ones. Uh, as we're seeing uh, now in the Syria conflict, uh, there are non-state groups, uh, off of them uh, motivated uh, by religious or ethnic considerations that are proving to be real challenges to the security of uh, West European countries and, and conceivably our own. Fortunately, some of these non-state uh, organizations are not just unfriendly to us. There are groups in the business community, in the humanitarian assistance community, who, unlike diplomacy as it was practiced in uh, decades past, now have to be brought into our effective dealings with, uh, with other countries. Good example is this uh, recent typhoon that uh, devastated the Philippines, Haiyan. Uh, because of our historic relationship, our treaty relationship with the Philippines, uh, we felt obliged to do what we could to help those people recover from uh, just a tremendously devastating uh, natural disaster. And uh, our military, our Navy, worked very closely with the various humanitarian assistance organizations to try to bring relief uh, to that, uh, that part of the world. And in my work at uh, the Institute of Peace, uh, our, our Navy uh, folks came to me and said, uh, we have a problem that uh, the various uh, humanitarian assistance organizations, whether it's uh, Catholic Relief or uh, uh, Mercy Corps, there are probably a dozen or more that uh, are important in providing med medical and other forms of assistance. They really don't want to work with uh, the Navy, which provides them transportation and security and communications. But uh, as, a na as a country, we feel uh, that it is in our interest to be as a helpful as we can in these humanitarian uh, disasters. So the Institute of Peace, we negotiated between uh, those non-governmental entities and our Navy. They worked out a, a protocol for their cooperation, and, and so they've been able to do some important work. But the issue I'm raising is really to think, we have to think very differently about uh, the character of diplomacy. Uh, there's that classical image of the so-called striped pants cookie pushers, the, uh, the professional diplomats uh, in their, their formal regalia as being the, the, the managers of our diplomacy. But that, that notion of, of the diplomatic enterprise is changing in a fundamental, in a fundamental way. Another issue that uh, we're now confronting is that the bad guys have learned to use weak states, ungoverned areas of the world to set up training areas, operational areas. And as you know, one of the reasons we got drawn into uh, Afghanistan was that was where Al-Qaeda trained its people and uh, did, its, did its plotting. The interventions in Iraq because of uh, the concern with nuclear proliferation and in Afghanistan was designed to try to stabilize, uh, in particular the Afghanistan situation, a very weak government. What we're discovering, unfortunately, uh, is that that's a very tough, a very tough uh, uh, project to undertake. The notion of nation building uh, has, for quite a while, had a bad reputation, and I think what's coming out of the Afghanistan and Iraq situations is Again, we are finding it very difficult to make major investments of, of our resources and the lives of our, of our soldiers and diplomats uh, 
it's very, very difficult to go into, into different cultures that have been destabilized or, or dealing with their own problems and for us to, to create a more stable international situation. So how we're going to feel, uh, deal with the stabilization challenge is, I think, an un, unresolved issue. Then there's a new category of challenges that I find uh, really, really very interesting. And this is the, the impact of the so-called information revolution. That uh, the phrase situational awareness actually came out of the military in the 1970s when uh, precision guided uh, bombs and things suddenly uh, were possible because of GPS, the global positioning uh, technology based on satellite communications and other uh, new, new technologies. But it's now evolved to affect virtually all areas of, of society by virtue of the development of the internet, uh, cell phones, and other forms of uh, communication. That uh, we all today are so aware of our world and what's going on around it uh, that it's, it's affecting the way our society, our economy operate. Social networking. Uh, when I give talks, I left my cell phone up in my room, but I'll hold up a cell phone and say, this device is a fundamentally transformative technology affecting politics. So you go into almost any society, even a, an underdeveloped society, and people have cell phones. That enables them to know what's going on in the world. They can now talk to their neighbors, and they can talk about, hey, let's uh, go down to the ta town square and organize a protest against uh, corrupt government or, or whatever is going on. So politics is being transformed in a very fundamental way by the fact that people know what is going on uh, around the world. And uh, how we deal with uh, countries that are being destabilized uh, by these technologies is a new challenge. This is what happened in the Arab Spring. The, uh, the people in that part of the world, through these technologies, were fed up with uh, their government. They helped to bring it down through their ability to organize mass, uh, uh, mass uh, demonstrations. And uh, sort of power drained away from uh, President Mubarak and was out there in the streets. Today, of course, Egyptian society, its political order is in chaos, and we're not sure who's really got the power to uh, help deal with very important regional situations. That's a pattern, a development that's playing out uh, virtually all around the world. And one of the interesting competitions that's being played out is between leaders in authoritarian countries like Russia or China who are trying to control tweeting, control the internets through censorship, uh, and prevent their people from being able to uh, have information that would uh, challenge leaders' authority, uh, would prevent them from mobilizing themselves, organizing demonstrations. And so we're in a period where it's not clear who's going to win. Is it, is it the population with their cell phones, or is it the governments with their, their sensors? That's an issue that's going to be playing out over the next several decades, I'm, I'm quite sure. Uh, the notion of intelligence, spying, sounds like a dirty word, but in fact, intelligence has always been critical to our ability to uh, protect ourselves and make uh, wise decisions. Remember, it was our ability and the British ability to crack the uh, codes of the Nazis and of uh, the Japanese military in World War II that were critical to uh, our military effectiveness. Well, we're in an increasingly transparent world because of the information revolution. Our country is trying to deal with the fact that NSA can uh, monitor all the telephone calls and the internet traffic, and we'll try over, I'm sure, the coming years to try to find a way to put some limitations, constraints on that kind of espionage of monitoring. 
but I would sort of doubt that the Chinese or the Russians or other countries are going to move to the same level of discipline that our country, our people with their concerns about privacy will impose on our, on our systems. What does that mean? It means that these competitive countries are uh, going to know what's going on. So what intelligence adds up to means all about, means uh, is, is again changing in a very fundamental way. Cyber impacts I've, I've already uh, commented on. Um, finally, let me come down to two or three of the other issues that uh, make, make a big impact. One of the unique aspects of, of our society and diplomacy is our promotion of values. I mentioned this early. Uh, I can tell you as having been engaged in diplomatic encounters for some time that when we're trying to deal with what you might call hard economic or security issues with, let's say, a Chinese government, and then you also add to the agenda the fact you don't like their human rights practices, that creates uh, some real tension and difficulties. Yet the American public will not support what uh, you might call a strictly power politics oriented diplomacy. So how we deal with the world where we want to see human rights respected, where we want to see uh, democratic political processes uh, advanced, that's again going to turn out to be a big issue for the diplomacy of the future because this country is a change agent. Our social practices have a profound effect on the way the rest of the world operates. Promotion of human rights. Think of the recent Sochi Olympics. Our, our, our president sent a lower level delegation because we were offended by their way of handling uh, the issue of uh, uh, human rights as it, as it affected uh, the gay community. So again, a very different and a challenging dimension of our uh, politics. Environmental changes, I won't get off into them uh, other than to say we all know that because of the humanitarian crises that comes out of flooding, food shortages, et cetera, going to be a new component of our, of our dealings with the world. And then there's technology. One of the things that uh, we can anticipate is uh, we are entering or well into a period of unbelievable technological transformations. Uh, the, the information revolution will continue to play itself out in biotechnology. Uh, we're going to see transformations that uh, are, are just unbelievable as they affect healthcare. Uh, one of the things uh, we're looking at is, is the so-called 3D printing, which is really a way of saying that our, our manufacturing enterprises are acquiring technologies that if you combine them with uh, cheaper energy are going to transform the way our economy works. And uh, we all know we're in a period of uh, challenge in creating jobs to match this new economy but it will be fundamental to the way we, we deal with the world. So those are, it seems to me, some of the most interesting and challenging dimensions of the world that uh, we're, we're moving into. And uh, what does it mean for our notion of a policy, broad perspective, if you like, a grand strategy that will give some focus and organization to what are increasingly limited resources. When the world was fairly stable, you could talk about a grand strategy. I think we're in a period where, with the, the surprise element and all these other transformations, we got to think about strategizing as an ongoing process rather than the notion of just coming up with a strategy. And do we have the uh, organizational uh, basis for an ongoing effort to uh, update our approach to dealing with the world, given the fact that, again, we're going to be confronting changes very quickly. So here again, we have cultural and institutional resources to draw on, our adaptability, our innovative qualities to be an agile country. 
Uh, and this is going to require some, some looks at the way our, our leaders make, make decisions under cons uh, in circumstances of, that are very complex and changing over time. So we do have, as you could imagine, and as part of our current debate, uh, both political and bureaucratic impediments to being adaptable, uh, concern about the size of our federal government. Uh, we're dealing with uh, institutions that uh, grew out of the Cold War period, and in many ways they're dysfunctional or at least inefficient. So we're going to be entering a period where rethinking the way we organize uh, our government for making decisions, I think, is going to be part of our uh, agenda in both, uh, for both the administration and Congress. It'll be all the more difficult because of our constrained budgets. Uh, I won't go off into that in any kind of detail. And we're going to have to convince everyone, you all, that remaining engaged in the world is really uh, important to American interests at a time when people, many people would rather stay at home and fo uh, focus on our domestic uh, challenges. So we're in a period where part of the challenge is to go beyond the interests of, see if my little clicker works, or this one works. Um, when I talk about, uh, about institutional priorities, it's to say that uh, the way policy is currently made through uh, institutional planning processes, it's done institution by institution. The State Department, the Defense Department, the intelligence community, and their, their efforts are done separate from one another, and then the White House tries to integrate them. One of the objectives of this project that uh, I'm leading at RAND is to see whether you can't do it in a more rational way, which is to have an integrated overall strategy uh, that then will shape the way the different bureaucracies of our government function, uh, which is all the more ne necessary when you have limited uh, resources. Is it going to give me the last click or two? Um, I think we've really uh, strung out this discussion and uh, given you a sense of the challenge of trying to come up with a so-called grand strategy, an approach to the world, uh, one that uh, hopefully will sustain America as a leading force in, in international affairs, whether it be economics or the, our security or the kinds of social changes that are inherent to this very uh, dramatic new, new period in international affairs. Well, thank you for your attention, and I hope we have some uh, Q&A, and again, Appreciate your coming out on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, Mark Peterson. Uh, thank you for coming here to our university, Dr. Solomon. Question is, uh, in the 20th century, and actually in the 21st century, in your view, who was the cleverest president the U.S. has had with regards to foreign relations? I gave a talk to a class uh, earlier this afternoon, and I may have shocked them. Uh, as uh, uh, Gene Garrison implied, I, I worked for uh, a president who had a very mixed record, but was in some ways the, the one who brought a, res res a real strategic vision uh, to dealing with the world of, of the Cold War, and that was Richard Nixon. And the opening to China transformed the, uh, the power relationships of the Cold War period threw the Soviet Union back on their heels and uh, had a stabilizing effect on what had been the bipolar world that uh, had its real crises uh, in earlier years of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis probably undoubtedly being the most important. So Nixon did despite the negatives in his record, he, he brought strategic planning to international affairs. Today, I would say uh, we're in an interesting position. President Obama, as I read him, does have a strategic plan. 
His plan is to avoid entrapment in uh, conflicts that drain our resources. I mean, he's, we've all seen the cost of uh, what uh, we bore over the two decades in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we understand that uh, there are aspects of our domestic situation, not the least being our national debt that has to be brought under control. Um, the president has around him, interestingly enough, a, a new, a younger generation of people uh, who are post-Vietnam War, post-Cold War in their, their thinking. They would like to see uh, our values promoted more around the world, and for good reason. There is a study of uh, the, the pattern of warfare that, that shows that uh, democratic countries basically don't go to war. It's uh, the concept of the so-called democratic peace. So if we can encourage more democracies, it presumably means we're going to deal with fewer conflicts abroad. That's a kind of perspective that we see in Washington today. The tragedy is the world may not let us pursue that game plan. And we're seeing that right today over this situation in Ukraine. Here you have uh, Mr. Putin with a kind of 19th or 20th century agenda, territorial acquisition, trying to reconstitute a failed system, the, the Soviet system. And uh, the Chinese, in their way, they're, they're in a period where they're trying to go back even earlier centuries and establish control over their, their territory, particularly their, their uh, offshore uh, territories that they claim based on past history, uh, which are backward-looking approaches to the world. How do we do that? How do we respond to those challenges while keeping a 21st century perspective. Uh, is there a leader out there that uh, is clever enough to figure out how to square that circle or resolve those, those contradictions? Uh, I guess I would say that the upcoming presidential election season is going to see whether we have somebody who can, can reconcile those, those dilemmas. Mark, do you want to comment? And then I'm going to take two questions at once in a minute. Do you have a quick comment? Maybe I could just uh, pile on uh, in answer to the question about the cleverest presidents. I'm not sure I have a good answer to that, but uh, I think it is interesting, though, to look at the, uh, uh, the, the presidents over the last uh, century who came into office with the most international experience. Um, and uh, I think you could say uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, World War II uh, uh, commander. Um, uh, Richard Nixon, of course, who was vice president, had a, a great deal of international experience. Uh, George H.W. Bush, CIA director, um, uh, representative in China, other international positions. Um, I think there's a case to be said that, that those presidents uh, needed, let's say they needed less time for on-the-job training. And I think that might have uh, contributed to the, the, some of the quality of their decision making. And I must say that the, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to, 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 to see any other president, uh, to, 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 uh, to fault the current president for coming into the office with, 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 for not having a lot of international experience. This is a president who uh, uh, spent a number of years as a, as a child in, in uh, Indonesia and grew up in Hawaii, which is probably the most multinational and polyglot place in the United States. So I think that contributed to his, uh, his early education as well. I want to point out that when you pick Richard Nixon as the most strategic president, he's also the one who was the least interested in promoting human rights. And he's the one who was very controversial from the far right by Ronald Reagan, hated by Ronald Reagan, and also then hated on the left because of some of the domestic uh, context. And so there's something to be said for, um, as you have a strategic vision, than what you do domestically, and Nixon is known as, as overstretching to a certain extent. So anyway, an ironic comment on, the, on foreign policy. Maybe we could take a couple of questions. Okay, one here and then one in the back. Yeah. In, um, could in my you identify yourself and please stand up? Yeah. Uh, my name is Don Rudisol. I've spent most of my life uh, flying around the world working on international economic development projects. Uh, my question is this. Uh, in my business, I have to pay really close attention to foreign exchange rates in the management of development funds. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on uh, the future of the dollar, given our deficits, and also given these efforts in other countries to create a, an alternative uh, reserve currency. Okay. And I'd like to take the question with Mark Jenkins back there. 
Did you want to have that answered first? Or no, I'm two taking questions? two at a time. Two at a time. Okay, you guys are going to have to really think. Um, I would like you to respond to the issues of uh, isolationism. It seems as if uh, things get kind of lumped into two camps. Either you're an isolationist or you're uh, a military hawk. And it seems as we've got good examples in Europe where there's a lot in between besides being involved militarily. Uh, we can do a lot of other things and we don't necessarily have to play a leadership role. I think we've seen in our military strategy, maybe with um, Yugoslavia more, it's a, uh, a good example. And, and Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam being fairly poor examples. Uh, there are other ways to play a role in the world other than militarily. And that, in my mind, doesn't mean you're isolationist. And I thought you could be, perhaps say a word to that. I think this last point is, uh, is very well taken. Uh, one of the things that uh, we tried to do at the U.S. Institute of Peace was to uh, stress the non-military dimensions of uh, engaging in conflicts in various parts of the world uh, by promoting uh, dialogue and uh, other forms of political reconciliation. Uh, and we, with a very limited budget, one-tenth of one percent of the State Department budget uh, really made uh, in certain limited areas a significant impact. Just in the last day or two, uh, the Philippine government signed a peace agreement uh, with the Muslim community down in uh, Mindanao. Uh, it wasn't in the news, but for four years, the Institute of Peace uh, laid the basis for that, rec that uh, agreement. We had uh, somebody, a career professional, who worked with the Muslim group and with the Philippine government, laying the basis for uh, management of what the Muslim community called their ancestral domain. Uh, that was a real achievement. Uh, one of uh, the Institute of Peace's major uh, supporters was General David Petraeus. Uh, the military operating in Iraq asked the Institute of Peace to mediate between competing uh, uh, sheikhs, global tribes who were shooting at us as we were caught in the middle of their conflicts. And uh, again, the Institute played a role in mediating a settlement between these competing groups. Uh, our troops were no longer fired at, and uh, the security situation, at least for a time, improved dramatically. So uh, speaking on behalf of two decades of my life that I put into uh, building that institution, I think we've seen that there are non-military ways of managing conflict, and one of the things that uh, hopefully will emerge as we adapt our uh, diplomacy and uh, other institutions of foreign policy management is that much more support for these non-military techniques uh, will, will come forth, because uh, it clearly is uh, to our benefit uh, in all kinds of ways, not the least uh, we're losing f fewer lives and, and spending less money. Uh, as far as the question about uh, the value of the dollar, I always shudder when, uh, as a non-economist, I'm asked an e economic question that really I'm not uh, terribly competent to answer, other than to say that we really do have to get our national debt under control. Uh, this administration, uh, encouraged on by Ad Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who says, as you know, that uh, our debt is uh, as fundamental a threat to our national well-being as anything, that uh, if we can uh, deal with the debt problem while not shortchanging the many other areas we want to invest in, that presumably, along with uh, the increasing competitiveness of our economic enterprises, will keep uh, keep the do the value of our currency in good shape. Okay. Do you want to add? Yeah, just to, to, to add on to that on the uh, foreign exchange question, I, I share uh, Dick Solomon's uh, um, uh, modesty in, in, in commenting on, on, on a uh, question concerning exchange rates, but I, I, I would just observe that over the decades I've been 
following international economics, uh, I've, I've uh, seen this debate uh, swirl around uh, a lot. In the late 80s, the yen was on its way to becoming the world's reserve currency. In the 90s, with the, with, with the European Union, uh, the, the euro was thought to be uh, uh, on the way to replacing the dollar. It hasn't happened. Uh, um, and as long as the United States maintains a, such a, uh, an important share of the world economy, 20 to 25 percent or so of the world economy, uh, it's likely the dollar will, I believe, maintain an, uh, a status as a reserve currency. I think the real kicker would be uh, if China ever decides to institute the kind of reforms in its capital markets where the uh, Chinese renminbi could become used as a, uh, a currency in world trade, then that could start changing the situation somewhat. But uh, uh, I, I agree, Mark, that this uh, distinction between isolationism and uh, being a military interventionist, it's a false distinction. Uh, there are many flavors of uh, kind of uh, looking after your home front and minding your own, uh, uh, caring about your values at home, many flavors of being involved internationally. Um, it, it's, um, uh, it is interesting to note that uh, some of the most uh, effective uh, tools now being, being um, uh, focused on in terms of international diplomacy involve economic tools. Uh, sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Iran are the key to uh, uh, moving the discussions forward on its nuclear program. By the same token, it's inter interesting to see that economic tools are the main uh, the main uh, instruments at hand to, uh, uh, by the Europeans and also the United States in dealing with, uh, with Russia, uh, dealing with the Crimea, Crimean and Ukrainian situation. So there, there are many tools and there are many, uh, many, uh, many approaches to, uh, to this, uh, this whole question of uh, internationalism versus uh, uh, concentrating on your, on your home front. I'm Hunter Collins. I'm an international business major. I was just wondering with the uh, economics we're talking about here, strategically, is our military spending justified and where would you expect to see it 20 years down the road, 30 years forward? Eric, I'm taking two at a time still. Yeah. Uh, Eric Franklin, you mentioned in your remarks we need to be more adaptable and agile, and you spent a lot of time focusing on Russia and China as their state actors of concern. Well, who else should we be concerned about then? besides Russia and China in the 21st century? I'm tempted to say we don't know, but it's sort of anybody out there in a period, particularly where there's tremendous technological innovation, you can be surprised at uh, what either non-state groups or, uh, or other countries can throw at you. I mean, uh, we're all concerned about uh, Chinese hacking of our communications, uh, but the French have been uh, uh, notable uh, thievers of our, of our intellectual property as they try to maintain their economic competitiveness. I'm not trying to particularly to single them out, but it's, uh, it's another example. Uh, we're just in a world where uh, Many other countries and groups are being empowered by uh, these new technologies, and we're going to be faced with surprises. And uh, I couldn't tell you next uh, where where the big big surprise is going to come from, but I'm pretty confident in saying that there'll be more than one, and uh, we're going to be scrambling to try to adapt to these unexpected developments as they they occur. Sorry, the first, the earlier question was. Um, is the military spending justified, right. essentially? Right. That's going to get to uh, the question of uh, what kinds of threats to our security we face. And I, my own reading that uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel is in the right direction in trying to reallocate resources away from what you might call traditional military spending. Uh, to less expensive but nonetheless very important special operations activities uh, and more, uh, more agile forces. His reform efforts are resisted by established uh, constituencies and uh, uh, companies who have benefited by the lavish uh, spending that has made our military spending greater than all the other military spending accounts in the, in the world. 
So there is an effort to uh, throttle back, cut back in that regard. Uh, but there's also going to be, uh, and we're starting to face this right now, what you might call the free rider problem. That many countries, Europe, Japan, others, have benefited for quite a few decades by the fact that we have borne the burden of uh, security of uh, challenges that affect their interests. And yet we've been the one out in front. And uh, one of the issues that uh, will be a challenge to our diplomacy is to try to get our partners and allies to carry more of the burden. And uh, so you're going to be hearing more about this so-called free rider problem, which is a way of saying uh, the challenges to security affect not us, but lots of other countries, and they should be paying for their share of, uh, of the, the security budget. I think um, China is not the only country that's becoming stronger as a result of uh, its economic growth. Uh, the India, Indonesia, Brazil, others are as well. I think that's going to affect uh, the, the situation and make the world even more complex in terms of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the outlook for, um, for global stability. Um, just a quick comment on military spending. I think the odds are pretty good we're not going to be in any land wars anytime soon. But the priority uh, placed on, on uh, uh, serving as an offshore balancer and on uh, uh, protecting the security and the openness of the international commons, the, uh, the, the sea domain and the, and the air domains, will become more important. That will affect priorities for uh, military spending. Dylan Novotny. Uh, with the advent of the 3D printer and the fact that America is a hub for innovation, is the loss of our manufacturing base to China that big of a deal? And then the second question here. Zhenya uh, Avramenko, Global and Area Studies. Uh, my question will range about current uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, international community has faced an unprecedented uh, Russian military push uh, after the Soviet Union dissolution in, in Eastern Europe. And I have a very concrete question. Uh, Dr. Solomon, can you give any comments about uh, what should be the United States' uh, reactions towards uh, Russian aggression and considering especially the uh, deep United States commitments before uh, current NATO uh, allies such as Poland or Baltic states, for instance? The China case is very interesting. Uh, and again, I'm not an economist, but uh, the Chinese are in a position where they have, as we all know, been the, the manufacturer of sort of uh, light industrial products, taking away our, our competitiveness in that area. Uh, but the Chinese are not happy with that position. Uh, there is something that the economists maybe can tell you more called the, the middle income trap that uh, they want to move to uh, higher levels of uh, technological innovation and manufacturing. They don't want to be the ones doing the cheap stuff, if, if you like. And uh, there are some real challenges to them moving in this direction. They're trying to restructure their economy to be much more consumer-based. Um, uh, they're right now facing uh, special problems about the survivability of many of their enterprises, which are very heavy debt burdened at a time when the demand abroad for their, their products may be softening. So uh, the Chinese are in a transitional period, uh, and uh, to some degree it's in our interest that they be successful because they are a market for a lot of our of our products, uh, but they are also going to be major competitors, and they are stealing a lot of our uh, uh, technology and and uh, the things that give our enterprises uh, real advances. So uh, we're in a very complex uh, competitive period with with them. I mentioned earlier the uh, Trans-Pacific partnerships. We're trying to maintain. Uh, free trade arrangements on as broad a basis as we can to give our enterprises uh, markets on as broad a basis as we can. 
Chinese are trying to limit that uh, in a mercantilist way. So uh, we're in a period, as I mentioned earlier, where the structure of the international economy is, I think, going to be changing significantly. On the issue of uh, how we deal with uh, Putin's aggressiveness and the territorial acquisition, the Crimea, and where he goes from there, <clears throat> the strategy that I see us pursuing, and, and Mark uh, uh, commented on this uh, a minute ago, is to use our economic levers. That we're in a period where the strength of all societies is not measured by their military, but, but, but their economic and social resources. And uh, what the administration is trying to do, which makes sense to me, is use economic sanctions in a very targeted way directed at the people around Putin, uh, frankly, uh, trying to create a situation where he loses domestic support from those who have, have been behind his, his regime. Uh, will that approach be successful? Uh, Putin's a pretty uh, single-minded guy. Uh, his thinking seems to be uh, uh, of an earlier approach. And uh, one of the tragic things for, certainly for Russia as a society and uh, for, for Europe is if we get trapped once again in a, a situation of territorially based Conflict. We could say the same thing with China, which has extensive uh, offshore uh, claims that could draw it into a conflict with Japan or, or with us. Uh, so one of the aspects of this transition that we're hopefully going to be able to make uh, is away from the kinds of conflicts that uh, characterized uh, the 19th century, if you will, and try to create a strategy which, which will st uh, stress the economic and the social dimensions of change, which otherwise seem so promising for uh, advancing uh, human welfare and security. I'm Ruth Bjorkmel, and I'm with Global and Area Studies. You mentioned that you think that the mili military spending will be shifted to resources. Um, relocating resources for special operations, and I'm curious about what kind of special operations. And then David right here. David Wendt, Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs. Dr. Solomon, I'm intrigued by your um, anecdote about your colleague in Mindanao and the hard, heavy lifting uh, over a four-year period. And um, certainly past peace agreements have required that kind of strenuous multi-year effort the Camp David Accords, Jimmy Carter working away hard at it, your past colleague Chet Crocker, the Namibia Accords, eight years he was hard at it. Are we seeing now with Secretary Kerry a recommitment to that kind of long, tough struggle, Martin Indyk uh, with the uh, Israel-Palestine situation, uh, the Iran negotiations, and how much uh, is that process, if that recommitment uh, to that kind of approach of peacemaking is happening, how much is it threatened by the increased transparency, leaks getting out and so forth? Is that a, is that a concern? Uh, this last question, I'm, I'm delighted that you uh, called attention to the good work that uh, several of my colleagues, Bill Quant uh, and uh, Chet Crocker, uh, did on their negotiations. And uh, you've got to take your hat off to uh, Secretary Kerry uh, for his commitment to dealing with uh, two very, what we at the Institute of Peace like to call intractable conflicts. Um, yes, that has to be uh, a leading element in our approach to the world, although I will, I mean, I, I hate to be pessimistic, but the credibility of those, those two efforts, uh, that is dealing with the Middle East peace process and with the Iranian nuclear challenge, uh, are very long shot for being resolved by, by diplomacy. 
And, and so we're in a period where the Kerry approach, if you like, and these earlier examples of effective diplomacy, uh, current, current developments may, may challenge their credibility. Uh, there is one point of view which I don't support, but which is uh, why bother to negotiate with the North Koreans? They've strung us along for, for decades. They're never going to give up their nuclear program. So why bother to negotiate with them? The same thing is a perspective on the situation with Iran. I believe for, for reasons, if nothing more than, than public credibility and support for foreign policy, uh, you have to make the effort, uh, even if the outcome isn't uh, what you would like to see. And uh, again, one of the reasons we want to see new generations of talent trained up to deal with the politics of this very complicated world is so that we have people who can play a role in, in promoting diplomacy, uh, which, by the way, is very much in the minds of our military. I, uh, in my work in Washington, have gained enormous respect for uh, the good judgment of, of our professional military. And uh, I recently had a talk with uh, General Ray Odierno, who's now Chief of Staff of the Army, and. Uh, he said, boy, we really got it wrong with, in Iraq. We thought that our kinetic power, that is our raw military power, would enable us to stabilize the area, but we quickly learned that was not the case, which is why they retrained their troops and came to the Institute of Peace and, and other civilian entities to try to help them deal with, with that particular conflict. So our military is well aware that uh, the game of security promotion is changing. And uh, you may remember the very dramatic development where our former Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, tried to transfer, I think it was $700 million from the defense budget to the State Department to strengthen the diplomatic enterprise. And tragically, the Congress said, no, you can't do that, because we all know that there's a situation where individual congressmen have defense enterprises in their constituencies, and, and they don't want to uh, see those commitments undercut. So uh, things don't always work out in what you might say are the most rational or desirable way, but you got to keep trying to make it work. Um, would one of you comment on the um, special operations question? What well, we the special at? operations people are basically the ones who deal with the non-state actors, the, the Al-Qaeda's and other uh, groups that aren't sort of traditional in their military organization, but are, are causing us uh, real problems. Transfer of uh, very destructive technologies, uh, something that uh, is a real challenge to our security. It's not a traditional military enterprise, but it's critical to our, our security. Uh, and training other countries who have internal insurgencies uh, that are a problem. Again, you don't use uh, conventional military. The Syria conflict is increasingly problematic because it's an un parts of the country are now un ungoverned spaces, and we see uh, uh, militant Islamic groups trying to establish the base areas that they did have in Afghanistan. And uh, we're not about to put boots on the ground, as the saying goes, and invades Syria for, I think, good reasons. But you do want specialized military capacity that can deal with people who are preparing uh, to use violence against us or our allies. And that's where special operations capabilities come into play. If I could just add one quick comment on the previous question about the role of diplomacy. Um, th this really has been a banner year for, um, for diplomats with what Secretary Kerry has been doing with Syria, with the Arab-Israeli peace process, with uh, Iran, uh, now with uh, Ukraine. 
Um, as Dick Solomon mentioned, uh, and I, from my experience, uh, uh, no one appreciates or respects the role of diplomacy more than the U.S. military. Uh, when I was arriving in Iraq in uh, 2008 and General David Petraeus was leaving, I asked him uh, the, what his advice was for me in my job uh, working on Iraq reconstruction efforts. And he said, one team, one effort. One team, one effort. I think that's a good, uh, a good uh, indication of the, of the role that diplomas, diplomats and soldiers need to play in working together. And, um, there's a lot of expertise in the world that never gets tapped. And um, I think it's fair to say that in Washington, uh, we've had administrations that have, you know, that it waxes and it wanes, but a lot of times there's not a lot of reach out to where those pockets of knowledge are. And academic communities are sources of that knowledge. So on that note, I invite you to come to the Wyman Goes Global Conference tomorrow and hear some of the expertise of our graduate students, our faculty student projects, and um, our faculty, the theme for tomorrow very much focuses on development and issues of human security, very broadly defined. It also means it's very interdisciplinary. Uh, there is a, somebody giving a presentation or a poster session from every college or school on campus. So I invite you to come up to the union starting at, at 9 in the morning. And for those of you who are students, the morning is dedicated to international career options. So I hope you take a look at that. You have the general agenda here in your program. The other thing that we would ask is that you please do fill out a feedback form. It's important for us to get a sense of how, what you think of this particular event. Uh, other things you'd like to see as part of our programming, feel free to suggest that. We also would take your email and promise you that it would be used for announcements for future uh, public events. Having said that, um, on behalf of Global and Area Studies, the new Center for Global Studies, um, I want to thank uh, and ask, actually ask you to help me thank Dr. Richard Solomon.